Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. Hello and welcome to this episode of Back Garden Biology. It's high summer, the end of July, and my garden is starting to, well, kind of go over and look a bit shabby somehow. And in this episode, I want to focus on some of the things that you can't see so easily. Now, if you have a pond, I'm sure you're already very well aware that your pond teems with life and, and some of it you can see easily. But of course, there's lots of things living in your pond that you can't see easily. Now what you need to reveal the unseen life in your pond is a microscope and I've got a small one here. This is what we call a dissecting microscope. Uh, you look down it with two eyes obviously, two eyepieces and it's not got really high magnification but it does enable you to see very small things even single cells and in the past a microscope like this a good one would have really cost you a lot of money this microscope is excellent has really really good quality optics and it cost about 200 pounds so it's amazing how the price of those has come down and I'm going to show you some images that I took using this microscope just with my mobile phone. And because the mobile phone struggles to focus through the microscope, those images are not brilliant quality. But most of the images I'm going to show you today I took on a different microscope in the teaching lab here at Oxford, where we have a camera attached to a microscope, a proper camera, and those images are better quality. Now there are lots of small things inside ponds and I could make all kinds of episodes about them. But what I want to focus on today is to think about this. So here we have a nice green leaf. And we've seen before in episodes of Back Garden Biology that leaves are green because they contain a molecule called chlorophyll. And chlorophyll can harness energy from the sun and it uses that energy to put carbon dioxide and water together to make sugar. And sugar, of course, is what all life runs on. But the question is, what is that chlorophyll contained in? And if you looked at a leaf under a microscope, you would actually see lots of little green dots. And those little green dots are called chloroplasts, and they contain the chlorophyll. And so we can ask, well, where did they come from, those chloroplasts? How did plants come to have them? And the answer is that they got them from their ancestors. And the ancestors of the land plants are a type of green algae, which you might well find in a pond. Then you can also ask, but hang on, where did the green algae get those chloroplasts from? And the answer is that they got them from a type of bacteria, a special type of bacteria called a cyanobacteria. And those cyanobacteria are themselves often referred to as a type of algae called a blue-green algae. So the word algae is actually very confusing, and that's one of the reasons biologists don't really like that word very much, because it's used as a bit of a basket term to put all kinds of different organisms together that aren't really that closely related. So that's where I want to start this programme. What exactly is an algae? Okay, so what are algae? Well, this is something that's definitely an alga, and it's actually blanket weed. So sometimes in people's ponds, you get these horrible mats of green filamentous algae that kind of form sort of slimy clumps, and people who have ponds often battle against it and spend a lot of money trying to get rid of it from their ponds. But if we look at it under a microscope, we can see something that's really rather beautiful. And we can see that each of these filaments is made up of individual cells that are stuck together end to end to make a long strand. And remember I said if you looked at a leaf under a microscope, you would see that it wasn't entirely green. It would have green spots in it and they would be the chloroplasts. 
And actually it's difficult to put a whole leaf under a microscope because they're too thick, but you can see that really beautifully here. And those green spiral structures are the spiral chloroplasts in this alga, and they give it its name, it's called spirogyra. So blanketweed, although it's rather unsightly and at our scale, if you look at that, the scale it lives at, at the small scale, it's actually a really beautiful thing. Now here's a different kind of filamentous alga, very, very similar. Uh, it's called Mujosha, and it each cell has just a single flat chloroplast in it, and it can twist and turn and re-angle that chloroplast so that it can optimise the amount of light that it gets. So algae can be pretty clever. Now we also ask, where did these chloroplasts come from? And remember I said to you, well, algae got them from cyanobacteria. And this is a filament of a cyanobacteria. Its name is Nostoc. And you can see it's also a long, thin filament, actually with much smaller cells than the, than the spirogyra had, than the algae had. Now, how does an alga get hold of a cyanobacteria? Well, most cyanobacteria don't grow in filaments like that. They're just single cells. And what we think was happening is that some original cell engulfed a single-celled cyanobacterium, perhaps it was eating them, and then it gradually enslaved it. And so instead of eating it and digesting it, it kept it inside itself and put it to work. And we think that probably happened at least a billion years ago. And so cyanobacteria were enslaved by algae and put to work. Well, perhaps that's not the right way of thinking about it. Perhaps we could say that they've been domesticated. Or perhaps we can even say that cyanobacteria enslaved an algal host because they would have a protected environment in which to live. It doesn't really matter. The two live together now in such an intimate way that it's no longer a free living organism. That chloroplast couldn't just leave and resume its free living existence. It's totally dependent on the algal cell now. And we call that kind of event a, a symbiosis, a very special kind of symbiosis called an endosymbiosis, because it's actually ended up, one organism has ended up living inside another. And that event gave rise to algae and gave rise to all of the land plants. So cyanobacteria are the inventors of photosynthesis. They're the only inventors of it. It's such an incredible piece of technology that no other organism ever reinvented it. But like all great tech, they just stole it. Now, if we look harder at some algae, we can see other interesting features of them, as well as these chloroplasts. We can see that most algal cells actually live alone as single cells. These are chlorella, just means a tiny green thing. And you can always find those in pond water, little green photosynthetic cells. We've also seen that some algae gang up together to form these long filaments. And if we looked really, really hard at the cyanobacterial strand, we'd see something interesting happening. So most of the cells are these little tiny square cells, but every now and then there's a little round cell called a heterocyst. So there's complexity forming within that strand with different cells looking different and taking on different roles. And we'll find out a bit more about that in a minute. Sometimes you can find these really incredible algal cells. This thing, or types of algae, I should say, this is not a single cell, this little green football that's slowly whirling around here. It's a group of algal cells. They are acting as a multicellular being in the same that you are or I am or a whole plant is, not just a single cell. And so you've got the beginnings here of more complex beings. Now we have to ask ourselves, how does that happen? For most of the Earth's history, cells just lived alone. They reproduced, they led their own independent lives, and they died. But at some point in the Earth's history, cells started to form these larger structures. And that means that cells have to start cooperating, they have to start taking on different tasks. And that's a huge question in evolutionary biology. And to find out a little bit more about it, I went to speak to my colleague, Stuart West, who works in the Department of Zoology here at Oxford. So when, when people think about cooperative societies, they normally tend to think of like meerkats on television or some group of birds going around in some family group. But there's actually amazing cooperation within the microbial world. And one of the amazing things about that is that we're actually the product of that. So 
A human body is actually an amazing cooperative society in itself. We, we are composed of billions of cells that are all cooperating and acting together in unison to help us acquire resources and survive and reproduce. And so you can think of most of the cells in your body, say a cell in your nose or your liver, as sort of behaving altruistically to help the reproductive cells get passed on to the next generation. Now, if you want to think about how that evolved, we are quite a complex derived case and so we're not good for looking at. And instead, what you, what's more useful to do is go and look at little microorganisms that are still at that transition stage between single-celled and multi-celled living. So for example, some algae, like chlorella, will spend a lot of their time as little single cells, living sort of in the water, doing their thing, wandering around photosynthesizing. But then sometimes they will come together and form multicellular groups or clumps. And they do it when predators are around. And so there's an advantage to them to forming a sort of cooperative defensive group that's harder to be eaten by predators. If we look at different microorganisms, a lot of them do live in these kind of multicellular groups. But some of them have taken it even further, and they've got division of labor within those groups. So, for example, cyanobacteria have some cells which give up the, can't reproduce, they're not like sort of the average normal cells, but all they do is they fix nitrogen and they supply nitrogen for the other cells. And the reason they do that is the, the, the enzyme that is needed to make nitrogen is really messed up by having oxygen around. So what you end, you get these, they live in strands and you'll have a collection of cells and most of them will be normal photosynthesizing, reproducing cells. And then every odd cell are these cells called heterocysts, which are just fixing nitrogen and supplying it to those other cells. So in many ways, these heterocysts, these nitrogen fixing cells are really analogous to the sort of sterile workers you get in social insects. And so with some of these, these multicellular groupings, these cooperative groupings you see in, in microbes like algae, sometimes they're facultative, like the chlorella example, where they just come together and clump when there's predators around. Other times they're single-celled. But in other species, they're obligately multicellular. They're always living as, an, as a multicellular group. And an amazing example of that is, is volvox. And so you get some volvox species where... You get a clump of cells, and within that clump, some cells are these really big ones which are just reproducing. And then you also get lots of these tiny little cells, which are basically just doing all the swimming work and keeping the colony afloat high up in, in, the, in the water stream so that they can get good light. And so again, this is a really nice example of how you've got this cooperative group and this division of labor in it, these sort of reproductives and then these sterile helpers again, which are again, just like the sort of sterile sort of worker ants you get that are doing all the work to keep the colony afloat. Well, thanks, Stuart. So you can see that multicellularity, complex beings, haven't evolved that many times in the history of life. And that's because there's lots of barriers to overcome. And one of those crucial barriers is this idea about cooperation. How do you persuade some cells to give up their own reproductive success in order to help other cells to do so? And we think one of the most important aspects is if those cells are genetically identical. So all of the cells in your body and all of the cells in the Volvox body are genetically identical to each other. They all arose from a process of cell division that began with a single founding cell. And if you want to get that kind of stable cooperation to evolve, that seems to be a very important factor. Now, looking down a microscope is such a fascinating thing to do, partly because it allows you to think about all kinds of really deep questions around the history of life and how multicellular things got going. And, but I also love it because I love to watch the movement and the way things move. Things are very small and in that world, it's a very different place to being a macroscopic organism like us. We're very influenced by gravity, but actually small things barely feel gravity's pull. They're much more influenced by forces of surface tension. And here's some really just cool things that I saw in the pond water. This is a diatom gliding along. Now, it's also photosynthetic, and it enslaved a single-celled alga. 
So a single-celled alga enslaved a cyanobacteria and then was itself enslaved by a diatom. And that's happened several times over the history of life. And this diatom glides along by secreting a kind of mucilage like a snail would. And so you see them gliding along on the bottom of the microscope slides and they come in lots of different shapes and sizes. They have beautiful glass skeletons that can be sculpted in all kinds of wonderful geometric shapes. This is a ciliated protist, so it's a large single-celled organism, and the cilia are like hairs that cover the organism and they beat together in coordinated waves and they allow this thing to whiz and spiral around at very high speed as it chases around after prey. And finally, I managed to find these little vorticella and they are also ciliates, and I hope you can see this on a big screen, because it might. if you're watching this on your phone, I don't know whether you will be able to see this, but they attach themselves down, and then they use their cilia to create a current of water and pull in particles, uh, and that's called filter feeding. So you just pull in the water and you filter out any good stuff that comes to you. And it's amazing that you can see these little things that were whizzing away and creating that water current. And then if there's nothing much in the area they are, they can just pop themselves off and swim off somewhere else and have a go somewhere else. So if you do have a chance to look down a microscope, don't worry that you don't know what everything is. I don't think that matters. You can really enjoy looking at it all and there's always an amazing variety to see. And one of the great things is you never know what you're going to see. Every time you put pond water under a microscope you see something different but it's always a fascinating thing to do. Well, a huge thank you to Stuart West for appearing in this programme and also a huge thank you to my colleague Stephen Harris, who is a mine of information about all this stuff and helped me to identify a lot of the organisms that we've seen in this programme. I'm going on holiday now for a couple of weeks. When I get back, I'll be doing a programme still in looking at ponds, looking at frogs and toads and also some of the reptiles that some of them, of course, like the grass snake, also can be seen in garden ponds. So if you're going on holiday, I hope you have a nice time.